Good morning. And welcome to Amelia United Methodist Church this morning. I'm glad you're with us this morning, although it seems kind of sparse, unless everybody's sitting way at the back. Um, and if you're with, joining us from home, welcome. Apparently, it takes a village. Um, I have a note up here that says birthdays. So, to remind me, since I keep forgetting, if you have a July birthday, please stand so that we can honor you with happy birthday today. Right, everybody. <laughs> Today is the day for Praise Palooza. So if you want to come and get your Jesus on, please come today at 4 o'clock. It is inside. We have several praise bands from churches around the area coming to um, play for us and with us. And um, it would be a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, we are the host church, so we're putting this on for uh, the community, and um, to see all of your wonderful faces would be great pleasure. So come join us at 4 o'clock indoors. There will be food trucks afterwards, so if you're worried about dinner, no worries, there will be food. Like all good Methodists, we have food. Um, we need help in the nursery. So if you are feeling led to help with the little children, please sign up to uh, help out in the nursery. The service is broadcast, so you can either turn that on or turn that off, whichever is your pleasure. And other than that, I think there are only announcements from Pastor Ed. Uh, one quick announcement. Those of you that are reading the book, Mere Christianity, uh, we are meeting at Tuesday morning at 10 and then Thursday night at 7 uh, will be another discussion time. Uh, so you can come either one or you can come both. It doesn't matter. But we're only going to deal with book three. We'll deal with book four after because there's a whole lot in book three of mere Christianity there on the morals and how we should live. And so we really need to discuss that pretty strongly. And then uh, we'll do the last part uh, in the first week in August. So just plan on that, and uh, that's what we'll do. And then we'll be starting our second book. We're only going to get two done, obviously. Second one's going to be uh, Chasing the Dragon. So if you've not read that one, I've got 15 copies. I'll have them Tuesday and Thursday. You can grab one. If you want to start reading it, you can. And then we'll uh, discuss it in August as well. But I think you'll find anyway, some of you have already read the book, and I... Uh, you may just want to come for the discussion. So it's always interesting to hear what everybody thinks on it. So, okay. I do have an initial, an additional announcement. Um, the food pantry is in need of monetary donations um, because of the price of food going up and the need increasing. Um, we need to keep our food pantry stocked. So um, if you feel led to do that, um, please leave some donations. Our offering plates are in the back, or you can drop it off at the office. Are there any other announcements? Okay, let us uh, welcome Christ into our service this, this morning with silent prayer.
In the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Please listen as I read from Psalm 143, verses 10 and 11. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life in your righteousness. Bring me out of trouble. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please rise and join us as we sing those praises to our Lord and Savior.
Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we do have several requests for prayer. Um, one would ask that you remember our camp meeting in prayer. Uh, it starts next Sunday night, runs two weeks, and um, just a lot of things are happening. I've given two cancellations just this week, one yesterday morning, uh, that uh, are kind of important ones. <laughs> so one is the cook and the head of the cafeteria running our whole food thing there, and they canceled on me yesterday morning at 10 o'clock. Camp starts Sunday. So we'll have about three, 400 people on the ground. So I've got to figure out what we're going to eat <laughs> uh, for two weeks. So uh, be in prayer. We need some prayer there. There's, uh, I'm going to need to find a cook, or they have to meet all the qualifications for the state and the health board. So uh, it's not an easy thing to do. So uh, be in prayer for that. And then I had uh, a couple of days before that, who the one leading the studies in the afternoon the second week, canceled and said they can't be there so I'll have to come up with a study for the second week that I'll probably have to teach so and I'm already teaching every morning for an hour a Bible study every morning at the camp so it would be in prayer for us we need some prayer let's also continue to pray for Goshen and the folks over here at Goshen and the problems from the hurricane uh, the tornado that hit and I Guess they're still out of electricity. If you'd like to do something, uh, get a hold of Barb Benson. Uh, Barb's kind of up on it because she has family that lived in Goshen, and uh, one of her nephews actually w works at the fire department, was at the fire department when everything went down. So they kind of know they're working with the Methodist Church, is centering everything there. So uh, she's getting is in contact with the community in there. So. If you're wanting to do something, she said they're going to need a lot of clothing and stuff of that nature. A lot of people, a number of people are out. So we need to do some things there. So we'll keep you informed, but if you want to do something right now or something, get a hold of Barb and she can probably let you know what's going on. Because like I said, she's got family contact right there in the community, so that'll help. Um, Let's be in prayer. Are there any, uh, I don't have any requests for prayer up here. Any unspoken? You want to indicate with a lifted hand number. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we do look to you because you are God. And we acknowledge that you are Lord and that you are Savior. And Father, we're thankful that you are God. We're thankful that it doesn't fall on us. Because Lord, we confess we don't know enough. And we're not wise enough. And Lord, we're not good enough. So Father, uh, we want you to, we want to listen to you. We want to be guided by you. Because you alone have the wisdom and the knowledge of truth. Teach us. Guide us, we pray. Lord, uh, put your hand out over these situations. And uh, Lord, show us what we can do to help and to uh, practice brotherly love for our community and the communities around us. And uh, Father, we just trust in you. you. All things are possible with you. Nothing's impossible for you. We come as your people, and uh, Lord, we're looking forward to this afternoon and our time of gathering with other churches and just praising and worshiping you and uh, just singing to your glory. So Father, we just pray that you would be upon the service this afternoon. Lord, everything is in your hands. We bring our unspoken requests to you. You know every care, every burden. You know every fear that we have. And so, Lord, as we cast them on you, we ask that you would bear us up and hold us. And we just praise you. And we thank you, Lord. As we worship, may Jesus be lifted above every name. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Junior, excuse to Junior Church. With the two service, it seems sparse, doesn't it? We had about 28 this morning. I guess I didn't tell you that, did I, Erica? I think it's 28 we counted. So... But our attendance has been running last week was 101. It's been running right around that area, even uh, with the summer. So that's a good thing. It's just we're divided between two services. Last Sunday, this this Sunday, this morning, I want to pick up with the conversion of Saul. We looked at it two weeks ago, where Paul Saul becomes Paul. And how his life's transformed. Last Sunday we looked at um, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Trying to point out to us that uh, even as we enter into deep decisions, and we're entering into that into the church, we have to always remember and be careful uh, because... Paul in that chapter talks to us, uh, the same Paul that we're talking about, talks to us about it in a more excellent way and points out to us that as a two-year-old thinks like a two-year-old, that's fine. As an eight-year-old thinks like an eight-year-old, that's fine. But we realize that their thinking is very limited and there's a lot of growing up to do. And when you hit the teenage years, of course, that's the years you know everything. It declines after that, I guess, doesn't it? Teenagers think like teenagers. And that's okay, because they are teenagers. There's nothing wrong with that. When I was a child, Paul says, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I began to think like a man then. And when we become adults, we began to think like adults, realizing that those under had not been thinking on the adult level. They've been thinking in a different way. But he points this out to us, and I think we miss it sometimes, reminding us that even as adults, we are looking through a glass darkly. We don't see everything clearly. In the same way that the teenager or the child doesn't see everything and perceive everything clearly, we need to be careful that we're reminded that as adults and as we think and it's all, we are looking through a glass darkly too. And he says, when that that is perfect comes, where real wisdom and knowledge comes, then we will see clearly, but we're not there yet. And so... So since, uh, that's all right, if it's God, I look and see. I mean, we want to hear what he has to say. Um, so we need to realize we don't see clearly. And we're prone to make mistakes. And so Paul says a better way then is to make sure that in all of that is that we practice love then. That we treat each other right. And treat each other well. 
that we look for the good in everyone and we try to treat everyone in a way that's for their good or that helps them. Uh, Because that's real love. Love is putting the good of someone else ahead of ourselves, even our enemy. It doesn't mean you necessarily like the person. You don't have to like everyone. Different personalities rub different, you know, they rub you different ways. There are some people you kind of like, others you don't. But that doesn't mean that we don't treat everyone, um, no matter who they are, that we don't treat them with the respect and that we don't work for their good. We put their good ahead. Even our enemies. That's how we're to love our enemies. We're to do what is for their good. Now we can do that. It's, it's separated totally from emotion and how we feel. I can work towards someone's good no matter how I feel about the person. That's love. And so Paul says, because we look through a glass darkly, and when we were children, we thought like children. Now we became adults, we put away the childish things, but reminding ourselves we still don't see clearly. So a better way is to make sure that we put love with it. Kind of gets into what we were talking about, I have said a couple of times. We need to fight God's battles. We need to stand for truth, but we got to do them God's way. And it has to come from love. Now that's important if we're going to get along together in the church, isn't it? Even among ourselves. It it affects the way we treat one another in the church. We should always have the other's best interests in mind. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree. Doesn't mean there aren't times when we say, okay, well, you maybe need to go your way and and, and I'll go my way. That may be in the best interest of both of us at a given time and a given moment. And we find it in Scripture that way. And it centers in this story, actually, of Paul and Barnabas. And I want to read you a little bit after Paul became a Christian and after his life is radically turned around and this one who persecuted the church, this one that was so zealous... There's some wonderful things about Paul's personality. He's focused. He's zealous. He was zealous in persecuting the church. And then when God gets a hold of him and his life turns around, he takes that same zeal and that same drive and he puts it into serving God and doing the things of God. I always like to describe him as the energizer bunny. He just keeps going. You can't stop him. Keeps going. I remember uh, Woodrum said, Dr. Woodrum, an uh, uh, evangelist, an old evangelist, he's been dead for quite a few years, but that said one time, he said, Paul never, I mean, the devil never saw Paul's back. All he ever saw was the push of his shield and the thrust of his sword as he fought his way all the way to the city of the Caesars. That's a pretty good description of Paul. But I'll tell you, one of the things about Paul is this. I'm not sure you would have wanted to be his travel companion. He would have expected you to keep up. He would have expected you to be as honed as he was. And the problem came as he's, that's what you have to be to do what he did. He's traveling all over Asia Minor. Every place he's going, these people already have religions. There's temples everywhere. They're worshiping gods already. They already have a culture and a lifestyle. And he's going in with a message that isn't going to be popular. And he's going to be beaten. He's going to be stoned. He's going to be put in prison. He's going to, he's he's beaten with, he was flogged several times. That's 40 lashes. That's what happened to Jesus, you'll remember. He's left for dead on a couple occasions, and he comes right back. I always love that scene in, uh, when he's at Lystra where they stone him. They take him outside the city, and they stone him, and he's dead. And what happens, the church, the, the other disciples there, the believers, gather around him, and they pray, and he comes back to life again. And do you know what he does? He probably had to brush the stone away. Maybe they'd already done it because he's been stoned. 
He gets up and heads right back into the city. And you know, when I read that, I think Rambo. <laughs> this is Rambo. <laughs> Turns and goes right back across the bridge. Is it that? That's exactly what Paul does. Well, you got to be a guy like that to take this and to, to upset Asia Minor and on into Europe and these places and to challenge these gods and to challenge the leaders. If you're not like that, you're not going to last very long. Paul turned it upside down. Argues on Mount, on, uh, um, what is the Mount? Mars Hill. With the Stoics and the philosophers, he's brilliant. He can level, he can stay on a par with them. Quote their philosophers, quote their, their, quoted their poets. He knew all of those. Says, Paul's brilliant. And he's determined, but he wants you to stay up. That's how he is. And on his first missionary journey, there was a young man that went with him by the name of John Mark. And he went just a little ways, and it was too tough for him. And he turned around and went back home. Couldn't, couldn't put up with it. Couldn't stay on the road with him. And so when Paul got ready to go on his second missionary journey, he and Barnabas, what happens? John Mark wants to go along with him. He comes and he says, I want to go with you. So what do you think Paul's going to say? Huh? Huh? It's not a rhetorical question. You can answer. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, he, he quit. He went back home to mama. He didn't, it's not in the scriptures quite that way, but it's that attitude, right? I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, Paul says, no way. He's not going. He quit on us the first time. You see, that's how Paul is driven. And there was a man there by the name of Barnabas who is with Paul. Paul's the, Barnabas is the opposite personality. He's the one that comes along and smooths everything. And he says, oh, let's give him another chance. I think we should give him a second chance. And the division, they're, they're so opposed on this that Barnabas ends up taking John Mark and going this direction, and Paul chooses Silas, and they go this direction. And they divide. Now, it turns out to be a blessing because they're able to actually accomplish more. You got two sets now going instead of one. So in the end, their division caused a, a, turned out to be a blessing. We never hear of, of Barnabas again. So, but we hear of Paul because he turns Asia Minor and Europe upside down with the gospel. He just confronts everything and really makes a difference. We do hear of John Mark one time later. Because Paul is in prison in Rome. And he says, I, I, I'm going to be trying to do this. Send John Mark to me because he could be helpful to me. So obviously John Mark may have made him proud again someday, even though he blew it the first time. Um, so that's a good thing. We need all of those kinds of personalities. You realize we need Paul's. They lead. But they also, wreck, wreck, they also cause a little bit of havoc and wreckage. Because <laughs> they don't always have the best people skills. But they, they lead. They're trying to get your direction. But then we also got to have the Barnabases that can come back and pull the pieces together. And pull us back together. We need both in the church, don't we? Both are important. One can accomplish really great things here and the other one can kind of hold us together and picks up the pieces and keeps us on the road together and thankfully we probably have both in this congregation you can probably think of people who they lead they mean well and they're really giving us leadership and this kind of thing but they cause a little havoc in their path with a lot of people and then there's others in the church that are the ones that come along and say okay well let's pick back up they're not trying to attack they're trying to lead and, and smooth it all out we got to have both. Um, you don't want one without the other. If you have the one that's always smooth and satisfying everybody, you never get anywhere. And you don't accomplish anything. But you can't just have the one either. You have a lot of bodies lying behind you if you do that. So this is what we're encountering. Now, why is this important? 
Because quite often, let's face it, in the church, we have both things that happen sometimes in our churches. And there's all kinds of ways that we can disagree with each other and have difficulty. I think the ways of disagreement and difficulty are probably more than we could picture and imagine. Because every one of us thinks a little different, and we're all equipped a little different. We all have these different gifts, and we've got to put them together for the glory of the Lord and let Christ use our gifts and take us in a direction that Christ is wanting to go, whatever it is. We need that. But what's, what we need to understand is that they had the same problem in the early church. Do you realize when we think of problems in the church and difficulties in the church, and some are handled in different ways. Some are handled by people coming together in grace and forgiveness. Others are handled where they part company and do those kinds of things. And that's all within here. But the people here in Acts act just like us. And do you realize that when we talk about problems in our church sometimes... Almost most of the New Testament, all the letters in the New Testament, Paul's letters, all of them are written addressing problems in the church. Read Corinthians, read Thessalonians, read Ephesians, Galatians. In all of those, he addresses problems that they're having in the church that need sorted out and, and, and need uh, everybody to have a different perspective sometimes on and things. And so it. Things haven't changed in 2,000 years. We're not as unusual as we may think. In fact, people haven't changed in 4,000 years. Go all the way back to the Ten Commandments and look at the things they're struggling with. Greed, adultery, uh, those kinds of things, stealing, those kinds of... That hasn't changed in our world at all. It's people being people. And they had their struggles in the early church. And I want to show you one of their struggles this morning. I think you can relate to it, Um, and you'll be able to understand it easy, and we can understand why they were having a struggle with it, because we would probably do the same thing uh, if it was in our church. Saul, this is after his conversion, he's had his eyes opened, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit now, and I'm beginning in verse chapter 9, and I'm in the middle of verse 19 of the book of Acts. Did you find it? Oh, she's not even here. Where's Renee? Oh, she went downstairs, didn't she? Because she came and wanted me to find where the text was going to be this morning in her Bible. So we had it all marked out and ready to go. So all she had to do was open and she knew where she was. And then she's downstairs. Okay, that's all right. She can look at it. She can show you where it is at home, Michelle, when you get there. Paul, Saul, his name is Saul now. He hadn't changed it to Paul yet. He'll do that on his first missionary journey. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. That's where he had the experience on the road. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? Among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take his prisoners to the chief priests? As, uh, take them as prisoners to the chief priests. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them, moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea 
and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, give us wisdom as we think on your word. And give us understanding. May your Holy Spirit be upon us. Direct us to the truth. Show us your word and show us ourselves. So that we might become what you want us to be. Holy Spirit, teach us. We pray in your name. Amen. Saul's had this great conversion. Can you imagine? Here's the one that was persecuting the church. It says he went out breathing threats against the Christians. Anyone that followed that way. Everyone's terrified. It's caused many to flee Jerusalem because of what Saul's doing. He, he's, he's driven. And he's, remember, he's on the road to go to Damascus to imprison any Christians he found there and bring them back to Jerusalem as prisoners. And, and this is what Paul's doing. And that's when he meets Jesus and his life turns around. Well, okay. And now he starts to preach that Jesus is the Christ. He goes into the synagogue, but all the Christians uh, around that are believers, they don't know what to make of him. They're a bit terrified of him. And you can imagine what's going through their minds. This is a guy that hates the church so bad and is imprisoning and beating and, and even executing. He was there at the stoning of Stephen and he was part of it for being a Christian. Stephen was, still, was stoned. And yet here's a man now that says he's turned around, is starting to preach Christ, but you can imagine what's going through their minds. Is he just doing this to kind of get in with the group, and then he can actually see who are Christians and who aren't, and then he'll take them prisoners back there. You can see how human reasoning, this is the way many of us would have thought, if this is what had happened in our midst, we would be suspicious. They're suspicious. What do we do with this man? Yeah, he claims to have met God and turned around. But we haven't had much time to really see yet. I hear what he's saying. You see how the human element is working here. And then it's Barnabas. The Barnabas we've been talking about. It's Barnabas when he gets to Jerusalem. In fact, the Jews, he's speaking so persuasively about that Jesus is the Christ that he's actually proving it to many of the Jews. And many of the Jews are converting and becoming Christians. And so that makes the Jew, other Jews that are there, that what are we going to do with this? People are believing. People are being converted. He's proving that Jesus is the Christ. So what are you going to do with him? Well, you do what anybody would do in that day. What you would do is simply, we're going to kill him. Let's kill him. That'll get rid of him. Now, we're not quite that violent in our day. What would you do? Well, I know what you would do. Let's call the DS and the bishop and have him moved. <laughs> right? Isn't that the way we would deal with it? Let's get this pastor out of here. We want a new pastor. Well, they're not, they don't have those kinds of contacts. So theirs is just simply, let's kill him. <laughs> we'll just get rid of him that way. And so in the story, they're watching all the gates of the city. There are lots of gates coming into a city of the size of Damascus. It's a major city in that time. And so they're watching the gates for him so they can kill him. And so they wait till it's dark and some of the disciples lower, put him in a basket with ropes and they lower him through a window in the side of the, of the wall and lower him out in the dark. And he manages to get out then and run off into cover probably. And he gets to Jerusalem. He gets away. They're going to kill him. I notice that later on in Jerusalem when he's preaching and, and he's being apart and things are going on that the Grecian Jews there, they decide they're going to get rid of him by killing him too. That's the way they're going to get rid of him is kill him. And so the brethren take him to the coast and they put him on a boat and send him back off to Tarsus. 
Well, Tarsus is his home. Remember, he's Saul of Tarsus. That is who he is. That's where he grew up. That's his family's there. So they're going to put him there for a while uh, so that his life's not in danger. Once he gets over there, he will go on over to Antioch, and it'll be in Antioch that we'll discover Paul again. Now, I want you to notice Barnabas here, though. Barnabas is, again, the man who comes alongside and says, wait a minute, guys. Everybody's afraid of him. They're afraid to trust him, even the, the disciples. He's come to Jerusalem, but the disciples, the apostles, are, they're leery. What do we do? Is this real or not? You can understand. And it's Barnabas that comes along and says, oh, wait a minute. He, he's got a story here. He met God on the road to Damascus. And he changed. God forgave him. God restored him. And he began to preach Christ boldly. He said he was preaching Christ in the power of the Spirit. Remember, he's full of the Spirit. In Damascus, and he's doing it boldly in the synagogue. And Barnabas again kind of comes along and says, I think we've got to give him a chance. See, that's Barnabas. That's that personality. We've got to give this guy a chance here. I think it's real. The name Barnabas in Greek means son of encouragement. <laughs> we do meet Barnabas in another passage in Acts where it says of Barnabas this, he was a good man and through him many people came to Jesus Christ. So Barnabas is a good man. Everybody sees it. And he's been a, a successful witness in winning souls. And he's the one that says, let's come alongside Bar Paul here. And brings Paul in. And through Paul and his ministry and his preaching, many people are coming to Christ. And it says that after he leaves, of course, then there's a time of peace among the church. It says that in verse um, 31. The church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. Why a time of peace? Well, because Saul's not there persecuting the church. He's not leading this persecution of the church. So there's a time of peace now that he's been changed. And during that time of peace, we're told there that the church there was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And it grew in numbers. It began to grow. And it began to expand. The people were excited about Jesus. It's easy to grow a church. You say, well, why in the world do we don't we do it then? Why, can't, why don't we see great growth? Because the way to grow the church is through the laity. You know why the church was growing in their day? It says so. In, it says in Acts. Because the church is being, they're running because of the persecution, many of them. But it says this, everywhere they went, the laity... They talked about Jesus. And it was added to their number daily, those that were being saved. They were excited about their faith and they talked about Jesus. That's how you go to church. It's part of the beauty of our congregation. That God has us living in all kinds of neighborhoods. Some of you drive in from Sardinia and Mount Orb and and we you know all the way down on the river. Felicity. And in our own the community here, we're spread out all through the neighborhoods. If we're excited about our faith and talking about Jesus, a lot of people are gonna be hearing about Jesus. He gives us different skills and abilities so that some of us are in warehouses and factories. Some of us are in office complexes. Some of us are in the school systems. 
Some of us are in stores. Some of us are running businesses. And if we're excited about our faith and talking about Jesus, think of all the people that are going to get some message about Jesus. We're not even all the same color. We don't have the same backgrounds. We don't have the same education levels. That's fine. That puts us in different places. Among different people. And if we're excited about our faith and talking about Jesus, can you imagine if all of us and the Lutherans and the Baptists and the Nazarenes and if all of them are excited about our faith and we're all talking about Jesus, there probably isn't a single person in the community that wouldn't hear about Jesus every day. That's how you build the church. They don't come in because of our signs. We'll have a praise palooza today. We were talking about it in the first service. It'll be a wonderful time. We'll have people from the other churches come. We'll sing praise. But there won't be any non-Christians that come off the street to come here just for our praise palooza. They don't come for our website. Non-Christians don't search websites for churches. The people a website might reach would be a new couple coming into town that are already Christian who are searching for a church. They might look on it, but not non-believers. You see, the early church is excited, and God's strengthening them, and he's encouraging them through the Holy Spirit, and Paul's been out there on the front line there too now. He's going to be on the front line leading the charge through Asia Minor, and everywhere they go, it says they talked, they were excited about their faith, and they shared Jesus with people, and it's added to their numbers daily, those that are coming to faith and believing because of their testimony. We got to get back to that. Amen? We got to get back to that. Being excited about faith, I can tell you this if you and I are not excited about our faith, we're not going to get anybody else excited. If we're not excited to be in the presence of the Lord, why would our neighbor be interested? We got to get back to. The grass roots. The grass roots of the Methodist movement early on, way back in Wesley's day, was lay people sharing their faith house to house when they moved into new communities. It was built out of the house churches. As the pioneers moved forwards, they would, move, they would visit every house and invite them to a house meeting in their house to worship Jesus. There's a, uh, I was reading a journal of a Presbyterian pastor Way back in the, this would have been in the early 1800s, late 1700s. And he was moving westward, and he was moving into a new community there, an area where pioneers had come in. And he, said, I, he says in his thing, I determined I was going to get to the houses in there before the Methodists could get to them. And he says right there in his journal, he said, every house I visited, the Methodists had already been there. All the, the Methodist laity had been there. They didn't even have preachers. You had a circuit rider. You realize our discipline requires us to have communion once every three months. Not every Sunday. Not once a month. Every three months. Why? Because most all of those churches were pastored by circuit riders. And the circuit rider might be, might be back for another couple months. And so you had to make it so that it was possible to do it. Because they had to only have communion when the, when the pastor came. And he'd only be there. And all weddings would be scheduled that week. There would be gobs of weddings. And there would be memorial services. They did it when the pastor came to town. He wouldn't be there for two months. And all of this other was going on by the laity of the church. It was a lay movement for Christ. And I got to tell you, that's the only thing that's going to work in our day. It's lay people who love Jesus and talk about Jesus. 
that was fascinating this morning because it worked out there this this service not as much in that I'm sitting out there and I'm worn out after the first service in choir practice and I have to just sit for a little bit and I was talking to Wayne and some of them so I didn't hear all but the beginning at the beginning of the 8:30 service before it started and Sarah Jane's sitting here she can testify to that because she was part of it we're all standing around what do you think we were talking about the Reds game. Isn't that the logical thing you talk about? We're all talking about the Reds beating, the, you know, winning yesterday and the day before. Everybody's talking about the Reds. We're excited about the Reds. Okay, it's all right to be excited about the Reds. But wouldn't it be nice to be excited about Jesus and talk about Jesus with our neighbors? You see, we talk about what we're excited about. We've got to get excited about Jesus and the things that God's doing. And as we share that, and as we share, this is what God's doing in my life. That's a testimony only you can give to another person. You see, you don't quote scriptures. Most of the community, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. So scripture doesn't mean anything to them. But they're interested when you start talking about how Jesus changed my life. Because most of them are looking for something that can change their life. Almost every person is. They want something that can make a difference in their life. And when you can say, look what Jesus has done for me. <laughs> See, you don't have to know scripture to do that. But you have to know Jesus. And when you can start doing that, and are excited about what Jesus is doing in your life, you say, well, I met Jesus 25 years ago. I'm not interested in that. That was 25 years ago. What's he doing today in your life? What difference is he making right now in your life? And you say, well, I don't think anything's happening there. Then maybe you need to get back to Jesus again. Because we have a t way of losing that excitement, don't we? If we, it's not rekindled, we lose it. That's just being people. That's people being people. That's all that is. We have to keep it kindled. And we have to keep the relationship fresh. This is happening in the early church. I noticed one last thing. I'm going to stop. It says it grew in... It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Well, what does it, you might ask, what does it mean to, for the church to live in the fear of the Lord? Well, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. And we're going to deal with it a little bit. I'm going to reflect on it and uh, let's think about it next Sunday. So you're going to have to come back if you, if you want to see it again, Okay. And so, uh, talk about that a little bit. What does it mean to live in the fear of the Lord as a person and then together as a church, as a body? What is that going to look like? Well, it's a good, good thing to think about. You can think about it all week. I might direct you, because the Bible says that wis the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's where wisdom begins. We want to have wisdom. So, we'll look into it a little bit next week. God wants to strengthen us, encourage us, so that there can be added to our number daily those that are being saved. God hasn't changed. His power hasn't changed. And everything he does in the early church, he can do through you and me. And I've got to just put this little thing in there. He can do it through you and me, and we want him to do it through and us, regardless of what denomination we happen to be in. There are some people that think that, oh, if we just pull out of the Methodist church, now all of a sudden we'll be going well and we'll get all this set up. Now we can be just as dead in the new denomination as we were in an old denomination. That's not the key. The key is the presence of the Lord and His Holy Spirit. That's the key. The other tags are tags. And they may mean this or that. 
But the key is, do we know Jesus? Is Jesus living in us? Is his Holy Spirit working through us? And are we winning our community to Jesus Christ? That's our key. It's something we need to think about. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful, Lord, for all the things that you're able to do and that you're willing to do because, Lord, you want it. You want the best for our church. You want the best for each one of us that's sitting here. That's your love that always looks for the best in us and always wants your best in our lives. That's where your love comes in for us, Lord. So, Father, may we allow ourselves to be loved by you. May we find that center. And then may we love others and help them to find the center, too. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, you know, I believe in miracles still. Uh, And so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, Did anybody get up and on the wall of your bedroom, or maybe it was the bathroom, or maybe the kitchen, Did you see writing on the wall? I mean, writing on the wall, like they did in Daniel, that said, don't come to Praise Palooza. Did anybody see that? Did God give that message to anybody? If he didn't, then I'm going to expect everybody to be here, right? Yeah, then we'll be here. We'll praise and worship together. Because we didn't get a message from God that said don't, right? All right. Let's stand together and we'll sing a verse of our closing hymn. I don't remember what it is. sing that song another week since we only got to sing one verse and you can bring your roller skates it it, it kind of feels that way doesn't it? it feels like a skating song let's pray father go with us from this place may we be the church may we be those people lord who are in love with jesus may we talk about him and may we live the way he taught us to live so that other people might come to know him too Go with us, empower us, encourage us with your spirit. Strengthen us with the spirit, we pray. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.